If you've spent any amount of time in spaceflight circles, you've probably come across Jupiter 3 before. And if you'd simply written off as another crazy white paper proposal from the distant past, you wouldn't be that alone. However, the Jupiter 3 has a few very interesting things to teach us about rocket design and mission planning, and in fact links somewhat directly to the SLX rocket that we eventually ended up with. To begin with, a little bit of context. Uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s, NASA was looking into things to do with the space shuttle after the ISS has been completed, at this time about 2010. Uh, this is before the Columbia disaster and uh, the rise of the, the private launcher market. So the shuttle and its related technologies are expected to still maintain the backbone for the US launch capability well into the 2010s and even 2020s. One of the cheapest, fastest and safest ways to get a new launch vehicle is to adapt a vehicle you already have into something new. Uh, this is the whole general philosophy behind the shuttle-derived launch vehicle, and there were frankly an absurd number of these over the three decades of the shuttle program, the decade before the shuttle program, and even afterwards. Only a few of those, however, have ever left the design paper, and one of these is Shuttle Cargo, or Shuttle C. Uh, in general, the, the design goes that you remove all the orbital parts to do with reuse, so the wings and the crew, the cabin, and you just sort of, you're left with like a, a cargo tube, like a fairing, and but you leave the propulsion section and the engines on, and without all this extra hardware, you could get up to about 77 metric tons as opposed to the shuttle's 25 or so. Uh, the numbers do vary, but it's usually mid-70s. However, due to the fact that it was expendable, and therefore expensive, uh, no one wanted to pay for it, so other than a full-size mock-up, which is about as far as everything else had got at this point, um, Chelsea was written off. This is where Team Vision enter the picture. So Team Vision was an aerospace design company founded by Stephen Matchin in the mid-90s, and they were given several launch contracts from NASA to look into super heavy lift designs. Uh, and you see, one of the physical issues with Shuttle C is that due to its side mount nature, uh, there's a there's a hard limit as to how big payloads can be. Their solution to this problem was to take two Shuttle Cs and place them up against each other. In this way, the lateral forces would cancel each other out. And since you would have to put a tank or something in there anyway, uh, it makes sense to put it on the stage. And this is actually the basic principle behind the Jupiter 3. And in fact, the load paths would be so similar that you would essentially have a very common tank between the, the regular shuttle and the Jupiter 3. A common mistake I see people make about the Jupiter 3 core specifically is it's a Saturn S1C first stage. And while it is 10 meters across, it's actually a completely new tank design based on the integrated common evolved stage technology, or ISIS, which is a hydrogen oxygen tank. It's also often depicted as having a white with black exterior instead of the shuttle's orange tank. Um, and the five engines are not actually F1 engines, they are RS100s. And Stephen said that these were an extrapolation of recent Hydrodox engine developments, which I'm fairly sure means something about the RS68. And the RS100 would be about 50% more thrust than the RS68. However, uh, there was actually another design option for this. Uh, it had seven upgraded RS25s to be about 20% more thrust and in fact wouldn't stage off to a second stage at all. Instead, doing a fuel switch to drain directly from the core tank and taking that core all the way up to orbit. The aim for this was to refuel that tank in orbit and, to quote Stephen, send more mass to Mars than anyone knew what to do with. This option, however, was never really published anywhere or given any serious considerations because the modifications to the RS-25 would have been so extreme that there would essentially be no RS-25 left in the middle of it. You may have noticed that it's a Jupiter 3, which of course implies a 1 and a 2. And these are actually also very interesting vehicles in their own right. Uh, the ISIS technology that I've mentioned already would be first used on these rockets and then proofed out up to the Jupiter 3. However, I'm actually going to start with the Jupiter 2 and you'll see why in a minute. So the Jupiter 2 also has a 10 meter core section uh, with two 5 segment solid rocket boosters. And there are two really interesting design choices I want to talk about with this rocket. The first is the five segment boosters. You see the Jupiter 1, the Jupiter 3 and the shuttle all use four segments. This is the only one to use five. And I'm not really sure why. Um, 
usually if you don't understand something to do with rockets it's probably because uh, you're the one that doesn't know something um, I suspect this is something to do with the contracts at the time though I obviously we ended up with SLS having five segments so not outside the realm of possibility the other interesting design choice here is that during the first stage flight more than 500 metric tons of liquid oxygen are pumped from the second stage down to the first stage I didn't actually ask Stephen directly about this but he didn't really tell me anything I didn't already know but I have a theory for this one you see it may not be obvious but the ratio of the size of the oxygen tank and the hydrogen tank on the second stage are slightly off the oxygen tank is way larger than it should be and you can see on this diagram the solid rocket boosters load bar you see this bar on the shuttle and on SLS are placed through the intertank section however ISIS tanks don't have an intertank they have a common tank dome so this bar has to go somewhere because this is the load path this is where the thrust acts on the core however this now limits the length of the core tank meaning that the core will actually burn through all its fuel before the boosters do which is not ideal so the liquid oxygen being more dense and hence easier to pump around is moved up to the second stage and then during flight would be pumped back down to make up the difference another interesting detail why the liquid oxygen and not the hydrogen well hydrogen has a very low density and it, because that requires much larger tanks and high dry mass from these tanks affects later stages much more than earlier ones so the small extra dry mass on the second stage from the LOX tank extension doesn't have not nearly as big an effect on the overall payload as much as a larger hydrogen equivalent would. Personally, I think the Jupiter 2 has been even more ignored than the Jupiter 3, but I kind of understand why. It feels a little bit like the weird middle child between its more interesting siblings. Uh, great for lunar exploration, it's a direct ascent cable kind of vehicle, a little bit more powerful than a Saturn V, but at this time they're studying for Mars missions and it just it just doesn't have them it just doesn't have the capability for that a final a final interesting thought about the Jupiter 2 uh, the first stage uses five RS-68s which fly on the Delta IV rockets uh, the solid rocket boosters are five segments which fly on the SLS the ISIS technology became ACES which then got wrapped into the Centaur 5 on Vulcan the third and fourth stages are powered by the RL-60 which is not that dissimilar to Da Vinci on the Ariane 6, though usually clusters of RL 10s are preferred. And the second stage is powered by two J2X engines, of which three were built and test fired. We could probably build one of these relatively easily. I digress. This is where we arrive at by far the most important member of the Jupiter family, the Jupiter 1. Put simply, it's a shuttle external tank and solid rocket boosters modified to have two RS-68s on the bottom and a payload inline on top. And if you think it looks like a stumpy SLS, that's because it is. Well actually, SLS is a stretch Jupiter 1. You see, the contract under which Team Vision designed the Jupiter 3 was one which called for analysis into a 450 metric tonne launcher. According to Ross Journey, in 2005 the contract was unceremoniously terminated and they were told that NASA had got the next rocket design already figured out, which is a curious detail considering the Expression Systems Architecture Study, which was looking to just that, had actually yet to be completed. But that's a whole different business. Annoyed at being brushed off after years of work, Stephen self published the paper they're working on, which you can still find around on the internet. and. I have linked in the description along with everything else. If you've seen my direct history video, you'll know that a guy called Ross Journey, the same one, came up with a very similar design as this, but actually completely independently. Eventually they bumped into each other at a conference and then decided to team up. This then led to Direct 2, then 3, then SLS. There are just two more interesting details to cover. The first is mentioned only once. Tucked away at the bottom of page 41 is a kind of hypothetical and in fact I did ask Stephen about it and he all he said was uh, if you must ask yes it was a thing welcome to the Jupiter 5 or Jupiter X Details are light but it was probably a 40 meter ISIS core with more engines and would have had a frankly insane four external tanks each with their own pair of solid rocket boosters this is a launch vehicle capable of launching 
one kiloton payload. That's twice the infamous Sea Dragon. Secondly, we need to talk about the four very large, very heavy solid rocket boosters on the Jupiter 3. You see, when we simulate rockets, we never really have to think about what happens before we get to the launch pad. We just run it and it's there. Uh, real life doesn't have these luxuries. See, when rockets are rolled onto the launch pad, they're empty and then filled on the pad. But the problem with the solids is they're, well, solid. You see, a full SLS core weighs over a thousand metric tons, but is rolled out empty at only 85. However, each solid rocket booster, being 730 metric tons, has to be rolled out already in the rocket. See, one of the coolers was modified to carry this extra weight from the 590 of the shuttle of SLBs. But there is actually kind of a hard limit here. You see, Cape Kennedy is a swamp, which is not exactly known for having great ground stability. And when you crunch the numbers, uh, the crawl away simply could not have supported the Jupiter 3 at all. However, if the shuttle had liquid boosters, this would be a different story. And that's the history of the Jupiter 3. And I hope that whenever you now see it floating around the internet, you uh, think about the clever design it actually was. Um, I actually got into contact with Stephen Metchan, the rocket's designer, uh, in the process of making this video. And uh, he actually told me some things that aren't elsewhere on his net. So I suppose this video makes that a secondary source now. Uh, massive thank you to him for answering my questions for several weeks. And uh, I hope you found the video interesting. And uh, yeah, I'm not good at outros. <laughs>